Hi, welcome back to week eight. We are in our final lecture of the semester. This week we'll be discussing the ethics of commercialization of sport and sport as moral education. We'll be pulling from Simon Torres and Hager for both lecture sections. The first portion of this lecture will be pulling from Simon Torres and Hager's chapter seven. This notion or this chapter will be discussing the commercialization of sport. Simon Torres and Hager start us off by addressing the notion of corruption of sport. They believe that corruption of sport has ultimately led us towards, and we'll talk a moment, commercialization and or commercialization has led us towards corruption of sport. So first, let's give a general definition of corruption. According to Simon Torres and Hager, they would call it a decay or falling off from an original and perhaps noble purpose. We've seen this or notion in many aspects of society, whether it's business, education, religion, and so on. And in our instance, we're going to apply corruption to sport. So if we take that definition and give its consideration to sport, what does it mean? So if we apply corruption to sport, it indicates that the values internal to sport are undermined because of the growing commercialization of sport. Let's make sense of that. The values internal to sport may be those things that we originally purposed sport to be. Fun, leisure, recreation, all-inclusive, and the list goes on. But according to this, when we apply corruption to sport and we begin to move off of those original purposes, which were those values internal to sport, and Simon Torres and Hager argue this is because of the growing commercialization of sport. Let's think about some examples. For example, in order to make games and our events more marketable, we've done a number of things. We've changed rules of games. For example, we have a DH in baseball. We have TV timeouts. We may even have officiating that favors the offensive side. We've also changed things in terms of scheduling. We have collegiate athletes being played, or games rather, being played at nine o'clock in the evening to accommodate fans. We have also can think about length of seasoning, season, excuse me, expansion, and even relocation. All of these things are where commercialization has impacted and arguably corrupted the internal values of sport. Part of the concern is then that the decisions made in sport are based upon commercialization rather than what may be best for the sport. In keeping with our application of corruption to sport, we're going to move on and talk about this notion of a corruption thesis. And Simon Torres and Hager want to point out that the commercialization of sport has turned it into a commodity to be bought or sold. Therefore, the transformation of elite sport has been a product. We view it as something that we buy and sell, and this is a result of commercialization. So make this connection and go full circle. So for Simon Torres and Hager, commercialization has corrupted sport, which then has turned it into a commodity that has that can be, excuse me, bought or sold. It's important to make some connections here with this corruption thesis. Those values internal to sport that we talked about earlier, whether it's learning skills and excellence and play and engaging for the sake of the challenge, is ultimately in conflict with values associated with commercialization. And those might be such things as fame, power, and wealth. It's also this connection that sport is simply regarded as a means to external ends. And we manipulate portions of the game, whether it's rules, regulations, in order to gain an advantage. Simon Torres and Hager go on to argue that the current state of sport today is simply a byproduct. It's a symptom of the underlying corruption of sport. And they argue this is a result of commercialization. We're going to go on now and address some things that are the outcomes of this. Let's work through several considerations of the corruption thesis, and then we'll talk about the impact of commercialization on, and corruption on sport. I think these can be best addressed by considering these three elements as byproducts, 
of the corruption thesis. I first want to talk about this shift from participants to spectators. We are growingly becoming a society of spectators, not participants. And increasingly, we're spectators in isolation. What does that mean? It's so much simpler and maybe even more welcomed to watch the game at home by myself. We don't do it with our among groups of people and or we don't even do it at times in stadiums. It's much easier to watch it at home than it is to pay the $25 for parking and the X amount of dollars for the ticket and the, all the things that go along with spectating at the game. So make this connection. One, we've shifted from participants to being spectators, but then we've taken that spectating and we often do it in isolation. So what's the interesting point about this? Typically in society, we have viewed participation as more noble, maybe even more valuable than spectating. Spectating is often viewed as this passive and maybe even slothful activity that requires minimal intellectual capacity. For example, I think we may think about the um, individual sitting on their sofa, grunting along with the game as the common spectator. And so this one of the byproducts of the corruption thesis is because of the sheer volume of what we have done to corrupt and commercialize sport, we lack participation in it and we have moved towards spectatorship. One, one reason why is because it's particularly so much easier. Also, let's address then this notion of external goods versus internal goods. I'm going to recall some things we talked about several weeks ago. External goods are those basic benefits and scarce benefits. Remember our basic benefits of sport. We talked about things such as health of competition, fun, recreation, and we derive those things from actually playing the sport. There is also that notion of the internal goods or sport. And that is we give the, uh, the notion that goods are internal to a practice or activity um, when they cannot be enjoyed independent of the practice or activity. Okay, let's make sense of that. Let me give you an example. The examples include having a winning combination in chess or maybe a home run in baseball. We view those things as internal to the game itself because we can't accomplish them outside the game. So let's make this connection then between participation and spectatorship with external and internal goods. External goods are derived out of participation, fun, joy of competition, recreation, and you have to do those from actually participating in the sport. Internal goods can be derived out of that spectatorship of the sport. That is, when we watch sport, we are actually provided with some internal goods. And because, maybe this is one of the positive byproducts, we could argue, of the commercialization of sport, the masses then actually get to enjoy spectating. And you can say that many of us do spectate from this internal goods perspective. That is, we see a home run and we find beauty in that achievement. We see a perfectly executed double play and we find beauty in that achievement. Okay, last concept here, undermining of internal values. Let's think about this. Those values that are internal to sport, Please don't confuse that with internal goods. Values that are internal to sport are things like skill execution, excellence, engaging in the activity for the sake of the challenge of the activity. Argument is that the corruption thesis undermines these internal values. And you can even think, this is one of those uh, concerns. In order to sell sport, we have to make it entertaining to the masses. And in order to gain mass appeal, sport has been lended towards corrupt behavior. It's more violent. It's more crude. We have more money-hungry stars. And the list goes on. So it's interesting to note then that we have shifted away, a resultant of that corruption thesis, is that those internal values are undermined. And we view sport as a way, one, for spectatorship and or maybe entertainment for the masses.
Simon Torres and Hager address two specific impacts of commercialization and corruption on sport. And I want to start with that bottom one, the impact on the individual athlete. We have seen a very interesting shift of how we view individual athletes as commercialization has grown. Simon Torres and Hager give this really interesting example, and I want to talk through this. They give this example or comparison of an athlete that played in the 1952 World Series. This athlete was by the name of Gil Hodges. He made a mistake in the, in the World Series that cost his team the series. And in 1952, fans supported and rallied around Hodges. On the contrast, I want to give you the example of Bill Buckner. And many of you might know this example if you indeed are a Boston Red Sox fan. Bill Buckner's infamous or famous mistake in the 1986 World Series game. He was playing first base and a routine ground ball went between his legs. It ultimately resulted in a New York Mets player scoring and winning the game. By the way, this was in the 12th inning of this contest. This was game six. The Mets went on to win game seven, therefore keeping the curse alive for the Boston Red Sox. So what did Boston do to Bill Buckner or how did they treat him after this mistake? They ostracized him. It got so bad that Buckner actually asked to be traded so that he could get out of the city. He received death threats. He was scorned and despised. So why is this and why have we seen this shift? I also think we've seen this shift even more so today with our social media age. Athletes receive death threats. Athletes are uh, ridiculed on social media. In this example, I also find interesting, in the 2018-19 uh, NBA season, in the NBA Finals, Kevin Durant is injured while playing the ch in the championship series against the Toronto Raptors. The Raptors fans cheered when he got injured. So what has happened? How has this disconnect gone? So Simon Torres and Hager want to point out that we have differing fan behavior, yes, and this is a resultant of commercialization. Athletes are viewed now as these high-priced products because of the volume of money they receive to compete we don't view these athletes as members of the community. Instead, we view them as products that are indeed supposed to produce. We also respect them less and as individuals, excuse me, and view them more as producers. We've also seen this interestingly where we discuss viewing athletes as commodities rather than humans. And we even look at their bodies that way. For example, it is the expectation that athletes should not rest. They should compete. Why? Because that's what they're paid to be do, to do. And so we view these athletes as these products, not humans or even members of our community. Simon Torres and Hager want us to think that maybe commercialization is the root of that problem and that's because we're becoming less ethical, we're less honest, and it's particularly on how we treat our individual athletes. Here's a thought, and for those of you that may have interest in the future, I think this will ultimately increase with gambling because we've seen this byproduct of viewing athletes as commodities and not humans increase with fantasy sports. I'm going to argue that that is going to heighten with the legalization of gambling. Okay, the next concept on the impact of commercialization and corruption on sport is the industry. So one of the things is important to think about is who's to blame for this current state of commercialization in sport? Is it the sport organization? Is it sport managers? It's important to note that sport is now a business and we can argue that the responsibility and or social responsibility of a business is to increase its profits. Why? Because of its shareholders, its stakeholders. So 
Simon Torres and Hager argue that there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits as long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. So it's important to note that one ethical responsibility of any business is to turn a profit. And it, the nature or the organization of sport doesn't fall outside of that. However, Simon Torres and Hager has some real concerns with a mere or only emphasis on an industry producing a profit. They believe that the moral responsibility then of a sport organization is to consider not only economic value and pursuing profit, but they must do so within ethical responsibility. And that ethical and social responsibility means that you have to apply moral constraints. Sport organizations have the same responsibility as any business. However, ignoring the internal goods and maybe or, and or standards of excellence of games at the cost of or at the sake of making a profit may not be in the best interest of the game or sport organizations itself. And Simon Torres and Hager then want us to think about tempering this pursuit of profits with moral behavior because the concern is, and that's one of the impacts of commercialization is the chasing of the bottom dollar has resulted in leaving fans out and or not treating fans and or stakeholders morally. The remaining portion of this lecture is going to address sport and moral education. We'll be pulling from Simon Torres and Hager's chapter 8. How do morality and sport fit into the greater context of larger society? Simon Torres and Hager describe this by the reductionist thesis. They determine, or we can talk about, how values in sport are related to values in larger society. That is, values in sport are arguably the same values expressed in dominant society. Or, another simpler way to state it, is that values in sport simply mirror societal values. So what values of society are reflected in sport and vice versa? We can talk about things such as competition in sport, which is highly connected to capitalism in our society. We value winners, both in sport and society. We value hard work and discipline, and the list could go on. And so the, con the connection is that our values in sport are the same values expressed in our dominant society. And we could list a number of those. As I've already indicated, they can be such things as competition, fame, money, capitalism, hard work, discipline, and the like. Simon Torres and Hager, though, do want to offer us two counter arguments to this notion. Remember, the notion is that values in sport are the same as values expressed in dominant society. And Simon Torres and Hager beautifully point out that sport has historically been a place of social protest. And that it has been a place that the values learned in sport played a part in overcoming societal issues. We can think about racial and gender divides, trust among diverse groups. We've seen active protests in the world of sport that have indeed pushed back against societal values. We can think about Jackie Robinson and breaking the color barrier, the 1968 Mexico City Games Black Glove Salute. We can also think about more modern day athletes pushing back against police brutality. And so sport and counter to societal values has been a place to protest those uh, social values that aren't appropriate. Okay, second concept that we can counter our reductionist thesis. And this, I would not argue, is a positive counter. The view on violence in society is counter to the view on violence in sports. We could also say it as the view on violence in sport is counter to the view on violence in society. Violence is condoned in society. We look down upon it. We frown upon it. We don't want to live in violent neighborhoods. We don't want to involve our children in violent acts. However, when it comes to the world of sport, we encourage violence. We give attaboys, we give paychecks, we repeat the highlights. And so this notion of violence 
seems to be rather counter on how we view it in society and how we view it in sport. Are morals inherent to sport? Simon Torres and Hager bring out the notion that there is an inner morality of sport. Let's make sense of what that means. There are specific character traits that are inherent to the nature of competitive sport. It's things such like commitment, being disciplined, playing by the rules, and pursuing excellence. So we can say that sports in and of themselves are value-laden and or are inherently valuable. It's important to know, though, that we may see this in other areas of life, not just in sport. It may be things like theater, music, and art are also value-laden by the nature of the activity, because just like sport, those require discipline, pursuit of excellence, and so they too are value-laden and inherently valuable. It's important to get our brains around this though, because it's gonna lend us towards our next discussion of how we use sport, because of its immorality, as a way to morally educate. So why did your parents put you into sport? Or what are some things that you expected to get out of sport? Many argue that we put children into sport because we believe it's value-laden and will teach some type of morals. I've already indicated that some of those values, we include things like discipline, playing by the rules, pursuit of excellence. Maybe you could even argue playing with others, teamwork, and the like. These are all reasons why we put children into sport and we say that we might even play sport. Because sport is value-laden, we use it as a tool to educate morals. And notice where we as a society place sport. Sport in the US is placed in educational systems. Think about this. Where have you played sport? School sport whether it's middle school or high school. Oftentimes these are placed in educational settings. So then we have to raise the question, should sports have a moral role in education? And as specifically as we think about sport being in these educational or school settings. So should schools be responsible to educate on morality? There's two very interesting arguments or concerns about this. Sports are indeed used as mode to teach morals and education, but the first concern about this or problem with this is the notion of partisanship. Partisanship is concerned because there's no one set of value principles that we all agree upon. What may be moral for you is not moral for me. What may be ethical for you may not be ethical for me. And one of the concerns with using sport as a way to teach or police morals is that no one has this agreed upon system. Do you think it's moral for someone to run a red light? Do you think it's moral to push your opponent to the limit? Do you think it's moral to run up the score? All of these things may differ. And so one of the first concerns about using sport as a mode to teach morals and education is this idea that we don't even have an agreed upon system. And so how can we use sport when we can't agree upon it or agree upon the morals or values that we should teach? The second notion then is this concept of indoctrination. So what does it mean to be indoctrinated? Oftentimes we think of it negatively. And in this sense, we're also gonna discuss it negatively. Think about school-aged children. Can they, do they have the capacity, one, and can they critically analyze and morally evaluate things? No, they can't. Children don't have that capability. High school students, maybe, and they're working towards that, but those lower than that don't have this ability. So the second concern with teaching morals and education is this idea of indoctrination. That is, School-aged children don't have the ability to evaluate these morals, and therefore they are given these ideas, but don't have any real ability to autonomously consent to these ideas. So, are we saying then that coaches and teachers shouldn't give any type of moral education? 
Now, Simon Torres and Hager are quick to point out that coaches and teachers do informally educate on morals. Teachers talk about respect in the classroom, not cheating, working hard, treating others with respect. And in the same way, coaches do this. They talk about sportsmanship, reflection, or excuse me, respect for officials, working hard. And these are all appropriately emphasized. Simon Torres and Hager, though, are concerned when we consider pushing other morals or other values on students and our coaches um, that may not align with their values. Okay, let's move on now. And we're gonna talk about the moral responsibility of specific components of sport. So let's start off, I wanna ask you, what's the moral responsibility of a coach? What about when you're spectating? What about when you're a fan? What's your moral responsibility? And then finally, what about an athlete? What is the moral responsibility of an athlete? These are all things we're going to address here. Let's first think about that coach. What is the moral responsibility of a coach? And does it differ based upon the level? Simon Torres and Hager say yes. They deem that the moral responsibility of a coach, specifically at a upper level collegiate and or professional level is to do a number of things. The coach's responsibility and morally is to promote the program, keep players eligible, specifically that applies to collegiate, maybe even drive revenue. The purpose and moral responsibility of a coach at that level is to prepare the athlete to play at the highest level. That does not mean that they do so at the sake of the health of the athlete. That does not mean they do so um, unethically or even with corruption. The purpose of this is to recognize the moral responsibility of a coach at that highest level is to prepare their athlete to compete and their program to compete at the highest level. At the youth level, this does look different. Coaches are expected to teach skills. When you think about putting your child into said sport, what do you want them to learn at a youth level? Skills, rules, uh, responsibilities, how to think about processing the game, maybe even thinking about enjoying it. So the moral responsibility at a top level is sometimes we could think about, yes, win, but ultimately preparing athletes to compete at the highest level. And at a youth level, it looks a little different. We're learning skills, guidelines, rules, and the like. Regardless, though, of the level of coach, it's important to note that coaches should treat their athletes with respect and concern for the athlete's well-being. But notice how that looks differently across a coach who coaches at the highest level versus a youth coach. Okay, let's talk about those fans and spectators. Think back to what we talked about last week in our moderate partisan. Simon Torres and Hager would argue this, the moral responsibility of a fan is to think in terms of a moderate partisan. Show moral regard for the athletes. Show moral regard for the coaches and officials. And even show moral regard for the other schools, the opponents. Also, fans. Show moral regard for your other fans. Okay, let's talk about athletes. What's the moral responsibility of an athlete? Think first, mutual quest for excellence. The moral responsibility of an athlete is to play the game with excellence. And to do so, they must prepare, practice, work through, and so on. I also want you to think, is it the moral responsibility of an athlete to be a role model? Should they behave a certain way off the court because they owe fans something? It's important to note here that the onus really in that instance is on fans to be more realistic, that athletes don't necessarily owe them anything. However, it's difficult to consider athletes when they are upset about criticism of their behaviors. Why can't necessarily have their cake and eat it too? Athletes indeed benefit from this stardom and we as fans must temper our stardom clearly, but it's also important to note that athletes have a moral responsibility to pursue the game of excellence and understand their role as a star. One important thing that I, we have not talked about that we must address is violence with athletes. 
certain athletes play contact sports and they are required to behave violently. Just in the nature of someone who is a boxer, that in and of itself, just to pursue excellence in that sport, requires violent behavior, MMA, football. Sometimes there's violent actions in basketball and baseball, and the list could go on of contact sports, soccer. It's important to know though, that for Simon Torres and Hager, they want athletes to think through this notion of violence. And again, this is for athletes who participate in contact sport. Simon Torres and Hager want athletes to consider the vulnerability principle. So what does that mean? The mean is Simon Torres and Hager want athletes to consider using the force or violence of the game appropriately versus using the violence of the game to attend harm. So think two different ways. Using violence or the purpose of the violence of the game to accomplish the goals of the game. Tackling my opponent so that I can accomplish the goals of the game versus tackling my opponent and adding extra emphasis to cause harm to my opponent. So for Simon Torres and Hager, one of the moral responsibilities of an athlete who takes part in contact sports is to behave or think through the vulnerability principle. That is, using violence within the legal bounds of the game, not as a mode to cause harm. We are nearly finished. We have made it to the end of week eight. It has been a pleasure being with you this entire term. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Let's give a quick summary of our week eight activities. We've talked about corruption. We've considered that corruption thesis and ultimately made those connections to how commercialization has changed the scope of sport. We've also considered some byproducts and some impacts of commercialization of sport. We then went on to consider sport and how it morally educates. We talked about our reduction thesis, excuse me. We also addressed using sport as moral education in a school setting. And finally, we address what it means to be a moral coach, fan, spectator, and or athlete. As I said earlier, it's been my pleasure. Have a great end of this term, finish strong, and we'll see you again sometime soon.